Before I turn over the stage uh, to Professor Tim Hubner, Chair of the History Department and uh, the real organizer of this event, let me just say a brief a few thank yous to the people who have made all of this possible. Um, first of all, I work with a really phenomenal team of people. Um, uh, most importantly, Jackie Baker. Uh, yes, give her a round of applause. And two absolutely extraordinary students who I'm very excited to be um, starting to work with this year, uh, Brianna Summers and Sue Eltiak. Um, uh, these are dynamos, and I'm very excited to be working with them. Um, to make an event like tonight possible, it really does take a village. The chief of our village is Dean Moreland in academic affairs. We are very grateful for uh, his support for this event tonight. Uh, very, very grateful as well to Amy Jasperson and the Department of Political Science, and especially Dan Cullen, who via the Project for the Study of Liberal Democracy and with the support of the Jack Miller Center for the Study of America's Founding Principles and History, <laughs> and all, um, uh, we are not only gonna have a wonderful reception and a book signing that will follow tonight's event, so stick around for that, uh, but we also have copies of uh, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution which is um, the whole reason that we are uh, gathering tonight. I also want to say a special thank you to a mock trial director, Anna Smith. How many mock trial folks are here? pre law students, give yourselves a round of applause. How many uh, University of Memphis folks, law school folks are here? Yeah, okay, very cool. Very much appreciate the support of, of uh, Gene Shapiro, of Ryan Jones, and of a whole set of others at University of Memphis uh, Law School. It's one of the treasures of the city. We really want to facilitate more exchange uh, between Rhodes students and uh, the University of Memphis uh, Law School. Um, and finally, a thank you to uh, Rhodes Lecture Board. Without further ado, let me turn this over to the person who uh, really organized tonight's event, Tim Hubner, and uh, he's the chair of the History Department. Thank you, Jonathan, and welcome to all of you. It's great to see so many of you here. It is my great honor and pleasure to, to introduce to you Professor Melvin Urofsky as this year's annual Constitution Day speaker. Professor Urofsky earned his BA, MA, and PhD in American history from Columbia and his uh, JD from the University of uh, Virginia. Over the course of a long and distinguished uh, career, he has held a number of academic uh, positions uh, beginning in the 1960s and early 1970s at the Ohio State University and the State University of uh, New York at Albany before uh, arriving in 1974 at uh, Virginia Commonwealth University as chair of the Department of History. Later, he became the director of the doctoral program in public policy and administration at VCU. He also serves as adjunct professor of law at the T.C. Williams Law School at the University of Richmond and spent a year as the Harrison Visiting Professor of History at the College of William and Mary. Over the years, he has uh, uh, received numerous fellowships and grants from the National Endowment for the Humanities, the American Council of Learned Societies, and the American Historical uh, Association, uh, uh, just to name a few. Other honors and uh, awards have allowed him to teach, lecture, and travel throughout the world. He was a rich fellow at Oxford University Center for Jewish Studies, a Fulbright uh, lecturer at the University of uh, New South Wales Law School in Sydney, a Rockefeller Foundation fellow at the Bellagio Center in Italy, that's my personal favorite, and a visiting scholar at uh, Ben-Gurion University in Israel. 
He has also lectured under the auspices of the State Department in Europe, Asia, and Australia. Professor Urowski is the author or editor of 52 books. These include seven volumes of the co-edited uh, Letters of Louis D. Brandeis, uh, American <coughs> Zionism from Herzl to the Holocaust, which was the winner of the Jewish Book Council's Kaplan uh, Award, and A March of Liberty, which is the leading constitutional history textbook now in its third edition from Oxford University Press. He has also authored important monographs on the Supreme Court and affirmative action, um, uh, assisted suicide in the history of uh, American law, and the Supreme Court and campaign finance. His latest book, a comprehensive uh, biography of uh, Brandeis, published in 2009, has won numerous prizes, including the Jewish Book Council's Everett Award as Book of the Year. Mel is a distinguished historian of American constitutional and legal history, as well as American Jewish history. He claims to have retired, or semi-retired, in 2003, but I don't believe it. He continues to teach serves as editor of the Journal of Supreme Court History, and is now completing his 53rd book titled Dissent and the Constitutional Dialogue, soon to be published by Pantheon. Mel is a kind soul, a great mentor, and a giant in the field. Please join me in welcoming him. As my mother used to say, after an introduction like that, sit down and shut up. <laughs> uh, thank you, Tim. Uh, let me start by reading you a few quotes about dissent. First one, I am unable to agree, agree with the judgment of the majority of the court, and although I think it useless and undesirable as a rule to express dissent, I feel bound to do so in this case and give my reasons for it. Oliver Wendell Holmes. Dissents augment rather than diminish the prestige of the court. When history demonstrates that one of the court's decisions has been a truly horrendous mistake, it is comforting and conducive of respect for the court to look back and realize that at least some of the justices saw the danger clearly and gave voice, often eloquent voice, to their concern. Antonin Scalia. Great Supreme Court dissents lie like buried ammunition for future generations to unearth when the time comes. <laughs> Kathleen Sullivan. Uh, I shall in silence acquiesce. Dissents seldom aid in the right development or statement of the law. They often do harm. For myself, I say, lead us not into te temptation. Pierce Butler. The right to dissent is the only thing that makes life tolerable for a judge on an appellate court. William O. Douglas. <laughs> this sampling of opinion on the value of dissent, or lack of it, could have been multiplied tenfold. Even today, when four out of every five Supreme Court decisions includes one or more dissenting opinions, there's still debate over the merit of a judge declaring that he thinks the majority of his colleagues misinterpreted the law. I strongly believe in dissent and believe it has an important role to play in our constitutional dialogue. That phrase, constitutional dialogue, includes not just debates justices on the high court have with one another in specific cases, or over particular jurisprudential ideas, but include discussions between and among jurists, members of Congress, the executive branch, administrative agencies, state and lower federal courts, the legal academy, and last but certainly not least, the public. In the time we have, I'm afraid I will not be able to cover all of these fields. For that, you'll have to wait for the book or invite me back for a longer visit. <laughs> the acceptance of dissent as a legitimate part of judicial behavior is not universal. There are many democratic countries whose courts operate under the assumption, sometimes even written into the law, that courts should speak with one and only one voice 
and that differences of opinion within the court should never be made public. I am not suggesting that individual rights are less valued in these countries, but only that varying forms of government have different understandings of how their courts should function. <clears throat> American courts began by following the British practice of seriatim opinions, with each justice writing in every case. The opinion of the court, that is one opinion for the court, began under Oliver Ellsworth and was institutionalized under John Marshall, and it was the practice for many years. If, as Holmes would later say, the law is a prediction of what the courts will do, one could now have a clearer idea of what judges had actually decided and rely on that judgment in future cases. Well into the 20th century, the high court in more than nine out of 10 cases issued a single opinion of the court. Because many of these cases had little importance to anyone besides the litigants, the justices believed, as Louis Brandeis would later say, that it was more important to decide the question than to decide it right. <laughs> Even if some justices did not agree with the result, they would go along. Or if they felt they could not, would merely note a dissenting vote, but did not write an opinion explaining their disagreement. In 1925, Congress gave the court greater control over its docket. Most of the cases it now took involved constitutional questions or matters of statutory interpretation, and it became more important not only to decide, but to decide rightly. As judges heard more constitutional questions, they found themselves developing jurisprudential theories that carried over from one case to another. Not only did they stop acquiescing, but they also felt it important to explain why they disagreed. By the time of the constitutional crisis of the 1930s, written dissents had become far more common and then proliferated in the 1940s. The constitutional dialogue since then has often appeared to be a cacophony of voices, each with a different view of what a particular clause of the Constitution means. Just as not all majority opinions are equal, neither are all dissents. Justice Robert Jackson has reminded us that the vast preponderance of dissents are soon and rightly forgotten. They play little part in the constitutional dialogue and rarely become accepted by the court at a later date. But some dissents are important, and these are the ones we are concerned with, the ones that become a canonical and influence the constitutional dialogue. Given the fact that only the hardest cases reach the high court and that in each question there are a multitude of precedents, rules, facts, and subjective considerations, it is little wonder that nine justices would disagree. Chief Justice Hughes expressed astonishment that in the midst of controversies on every conceivable subject, one should expect unanimity upon difficult questions. But for nearly 150 years, the members of the court stressed institutional unity and often denigrated dissent. Even the great dissenters like Stephen Field, John Marshall, Harlan, Holmes, and Brandeis believed that dissent should be rare and unanimity the rule. It is useful to stop for a moment and briefly look at the arguments that are made against and for dissent. Without doubt, the most frequent objection to a dissent is that it weakens the force of the decision and detracts from the court's institutional prestige. Judge Learned Hand summed up this argument when he wrote that the failure to secure unanimity, quote, is disastrous because this unity cancels the impact of monolithic solidarity on which the authority of a bench of judges so largely depends. Unquote. If people come to believe that the law is uncertain, that even learned judges cannot agree on what it means, they will lose respect for both the court and the law and feel free to disagree with it. In 1928, um, <coughs> Hughes, who had been an associate justice and would later become chief justice, found this argument unconvincing. Judges are not there to simply decide cases, he said, but to decide them as they think they should be decided. And while it may be regrettable that they cannot always agree, it is better that their independence should be maintained and recognized than that unanimity should be secured through sacrifice. 
Justice Henry Billings Brown, who served on the court from 1890 to 1906, put it more pithily when he wrote that, if the authority of the court is weakened by a dissent, it is probably because it ought to be weakened. Even though experience shows that complete unanimity is a chimera, most judges acknowledge that there is pressure to achieve, as often as possible, the agreement of a majority of the members on a single uh, rationale. Lawyers want certainty that the rule expressed in case A will apply to all similar and subsequent uh, cases. Here one has the rational of stare decisis, the doctrine of abiding by and adhering to prior decided cases. Most judges, and especially those in lower courts, feel bound to at least start with reliance on past decisions. When the court alters course, it taxes the public faith that is essential to its authority. Thus, in a case in which he disagreed with the court's decision, Justice John Paul Stevens nonetheless felt compelled to concur with the result. For me, he wrote, the adverse consequences of adhering to an arguably erroneous precedent are far less serious than the consequences of further unraveling the doctrines of stare decisis. Lawyers and most judges do not want to open for future litigation questions which a decision of a court of last resort should have settled. If dissension on a court of last resort leads to uncertainty in the law, why then do members of the tribunal file opinions accusing the majority of deciding wrongly? First of all, for practical purposes. And this is what lawyers are most concerned with. The majority opinion is the law, at least for the foreseeable future. While there are times, especially if a case has been decided by a five to four vote, when lawyers rightly worry that a change in personnel or some other factor might lead to a reversal, for the most part, they know that in the vast majority of cases, the majority opinion will stand, if not forever, at least for the time frame which interests their clients. After all, for all the dissents filed, only a few rise to the level of influencing the constitutional dialogue. Judges know this as well, yet they continue to file dissents for a number of reasons. To quote a Chief Justice, a dissent in the court of last resort is an appeal to the brooding spirit of the law, to the intelligence of a future day, when a later decision may possibly correct the error into which the dissenting judge believes the court to have been betrayed. Nor is this appeal always in vain. Judges dissent for many reasons, which vary from case to case, term to term, and justice to justice. Clearly, the main reason is that they disagree with either the results or the reasoning in a specific case. Justice Scalia has written that he will dissent primarily if he considers the reasoning wrong, implying that it is possible to get a result he disagrees with, yet will concede that the majority reasoning is not wholly incorrect. There are some dissents that are more matters of pique than anything else, anger that the court is not listening to the speaker who, quote, knows that he is right uh, in terms of constitutional interpretation. Uh, one can point to a number of examples, but to mention only two, there's Justice James McReynolds' opinion in the Gold Clause cases. He dissented in such vitriolic terms that his comments do not even appear in the official record. At one point, he bitterly declared, this is Nero at his worst, the Constitution as we know it is gone. And we only know he said that because there was a reporter in the class in the courtroom. Another such dissent, in fact, one of, can take many, Felix Frankfurter, who during the entire time he sat on the court, believed that he knew more than anybody else and they couldn't get it right to begin with. Now, ne neither the McReynolds nor most of Frankfurter's dissents play a role in the dialogue in part because of their strident tone. We may, be, we may admire and be moved by eloquence, as in the Holmes' opinions on free speech or Brandeis on the right of privacy, but we don't respond well to petulance. Sharply worded dissents by themselves do not, however, cause rifts. Scalia wrote that I doubt whether any two justices have dissented from one another's opinion any more regularly or any more sharply than did my former colleague, Justice William Brennan, and I always considered him, however, one of my best friends on the court, and I think that feeling was reciprocated. According to Chief Justice Roberts, all the members of the court 
are quite sensitive to the need to avoid comments that could be taken as personal aspersions. A justice is well aware that the person who wrote the opinion she is dissenting from today may very well be the same justice who will provide her with the fifth vote on another case tomorrow. Many considerations are present in greater or lesser degree, but at the forefront of consciousness are questions involving the solution of the case at hand. Nearly all justices have at one time or another said that when writing a majority opinion, they have very little leeway because they have to present an argument that will hold the other justices in the majority. The spokesman of the court, said Robert Jackson, is cautious, timid, fearful of the vivid word, the heightened phrase. You have to make adjustments, Clarence Thomas has said, to reflect the views of the majority, and if you can't do that, then you shouldn't write the opinion. When writing the court's opinion, a justice has to be very careful not to make broad, sweeping generalizations lest he lose some votes. Brandeis said that he always had to keep in mind that he was not writing for himself, but for those who voted with him. That is why majority opinions in most cases tend to be careful, precise, limited to the specific facts, and not venturing into broad jurisprudential assertions. So part of the dialogue is between the justice, the justice assigned to write the majority opinion and other members of the majority. Sometimes, even without a dissent at hand, it is impossible to keep five votes on board. One example is a gender discrimination case, Califano v. Goldfarb in 1977. Uh, in that case, Brennan wanted to place gender in an equal category to race so that any governmental discrimination would be tried under a strict scrutiny standard. He and three other members of the majority were agreeable, but not John Paul Stevens, who had just joined the court a few weeks earlier and was unwilling to do so. As a result, Stevens filed an opinion concurring in the judgment, but not in the rationale. And so even to this day, gender discrimination is not viewed under a strict scrutiny. In the wings, of course, is always, is awaiting dissent, or at least the threat of one. Hugo Black used to say, dissent keeps the boys on their toes. <laughs> Clearly, from the dissenter's point of view, the best result is that members of the majority will change their mind um, before the decision is handed down, even if there is no written dissent. It is not a common occurrence, but it does happen. Robert Jackson once commented that I myself have changed my opinion after reading the opinions of the other members of the court, and I am as stubborn as most. Justice Ginsburg says that about four times a term, <coughs> excuse me, an opinion starting out as a dissent is so well reasoned that it convinces enough just justices to join and transform it into a majority decision. In the Brandeis papers, there are a number of dissents written but never delivered. In some instances, he decided to, to quash his opinion for strategic purposes and that the issue did not rank as high in his priorities as did other matters. But in some, the draft dissent led the court to change its mind, not necessarily coming over fully to his position, but modifying its ruling to meet some of his objections. An essential part of the constitutional dialogue is the response of the justice writing the opinion for the court to arguments made by a dissenter. Once the conference has voted, the justice's writing, justice writing from the majority strains under multiple burdens. On the one hand, he or she cannot stray too far from what may have been a very narrow agreement as to what should be said. On the other hand, the arguments of the dissents have to be taken into account, if for no other reason, to prevent one or more members of the majority from changing their mind. Uh, Justice Ginsburg has written about what she calls the in-house impact, and I quote, My experience teaches that there is nothing better than an impressive dissent to lead the author of the majority opinion to refine and clarify her initial circulation. An illustration. The Virginia Military Institute case, decided by the court in 1996, held that VMI's denial of admission to women violated the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause. I was assigned to write the court's opinion. The final draft, released to the public, was ever so much better than my first, second, and at least a dozen more drafts, thanks to Justice Scalia's attention-getting dissent. 
her good friend, fellow opera aficionado, and occasional nemesis, Antonin Scalia, has written in a similar vein. In the fall of 2009, C-SPAN aired a unique program, a series of interviews with all nine sitting justices, as well as two retired members of the court. In each of the segments, the interviewers asked about dissent and what is remarkable is about how nearly all the justices saw dissent as an essential component of the decisional process. Chief Justice John Roberts, for example, declared that dissent is a very valuable part of our process. It shows the thinking of different parts of the court. It shows that arguments have been fully considered and it's valuable for the writer of the majority because we have a healthy degree of skepticism about what we're saying right up to the very end. Now part of the intra-court dialogue is the threat of the actual writing of a dissent or a concurring opinion that will not only, that will not fully endorse the majority's conclusion or reasoning. The mechanics of back and forth are far more complex and sophisticated than a no saying, I am going to dissent. Sometimes the opposing justice just does not agree with all the majority opinion. He or she may be satisfied with alterations that will not affect the major holding, but will restrict the jurisprudential rationale. The majority writer also has to take into account what might be called the dissent of horrible possibilities. Because the dissenter need not trim her views to keep others happy, as Justice Douglas said, the only soul I have to save is my own, uh, she can argue that the majority opinion will lead to a long list of terrible consequences. Uh, sometimes what you do is get a, uh, a justice who's in the majority who will then write a concurrence that essentially says, no, 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 this is not what it says. It doesn't really become that terrible. Political scientists have studied what they term judicial strategy over a wide range of issues such as which cases to accept for decision, assignment of opinion, and of course dissent. Holmes and Brandeis chose when to dissent and because they did so infrequently, their opinions received great attention. Other justices such as Felix Frankfurter compulsively dissented or wrote separate opinions so often that nobody took any interest in them. Frankfurter managed to alienate most of his colleagues by both his abrasive personality as well as endless and pedantic separate opinions. He began one opinion, I have read every case on this subject going back to Magna Carta. <laughs> <laughs> Who is threatening is also a consideration. A Ginsburg, a Kennedy, a Scalia, presents the possibility of a strong and well-reasoned separate opinion, a possibility that no writer of a majority opinion would take lightly. Warren Berger, on the other hand, has never been considered a jurisprudential heavyweight. And whenever he threatened to write separately, the answer was, go ahead. <laughs> what we can say is that all these actions are part of the dialogue that takes place among the justices in fashioning an opinion. Justices are aware that while they may hold strong views on a particular issue, if they speak for the court, they will more than often than not have to tone it down somewhat in order to satisfy the other members of the majority. The dissenter, of course, does not labor under this restraint. Now, threatening to write separately is one thing. Actually doing it is another. Of course, the minority justice or justices will write, and as noted, a well-crafted dissent will have an impact, not only on the majority opinion, uh, but may also take its place in the ongoing constitutional dialogue. A concurrence may also have this effect. One of the greatest separate opinions in the court's history is that of Justice Brandeis in Whitney versus California, which not only helped shape First Amendment jurisprudence for decades, uh, but became the standard by which we measure all such dissents. Concurrences as well as dissents, however, have costs involved, even if one has the help of capable clerks. They take time, they take energy, and may well disrupt the institutional schedule by holding up decisions. In a five to four case, a concurrence in the result, but not the reasoning, means that there is no rule with precedential value that will govern future cases or guide lower courts in this area. 
A concurrence may also go beyond what the author of the majority opinion states, a clear signal that the issue may not have been resolved. Uh, the case uh, in point on this is one dealing with um, physician-assisted suicide. After the court held in um, the early 90s that people had a right to die, that is, they could turn off life-saving equipment um, if they were you know, in control of their faculties. Uh, the next logical thing was people who were not mortally ill but in great pain or something else wanted to have the help of a doctor to end their lives. Um, Chief Justice Rehnquist, whose wife had died in 1991 after a long battle with ovarian cancer, took note of the fact that there was a profound and earnest debate about physician-assisted suicide at the time, and he ruled that while there was no constitutional right to it, the public debate should go on, and that states who wished to make physician-assisted suicide available could do so. There was no constitutional bar to doing it. Now, the most interesting thing about this case to me is that although all nine justices agreed with the result, i.e. that there was no constitutional right, five members of the court, majority, five members of the court wanted to go further. Justice O'Connor qualified her support by saying that the ruling would not prevent a physician from prescribing a painkilling medication even if it hastened death, an acknowledgment of a practice that doctors understandably do not wish to talk about very much. But four other justices, Stevens, Souter, Ginsburg, and Breyer, indicated that individual cases involving terminally ill patients might in the future be decided differently. In other words, they were holding the door open to rehear this case. Now, if some critics view the dissent as undermining the authority of the court or making the result less clear, there are those who dislike the concurrence even more and see it as little more than an ego trip. This would be true, I think, for many of Felix Frankfurter's 132 concurrences, some of which do little more than claim that he understood the law better than his colleagues. Concurrences, however, like dissents, may be a useful tool in the judicial dialogue. Sometimes a concurrence in the result, but not the reasoning, will serve as a basis for future changes in the reasoning. In Roshan versus California, for example, Frankfurter spoke for a unanimous court um, condemning, condemning, the tac condemning the tactics that California had used with the drug dealer, i.e. they had pumped out his stomach to get the uh, evidence. Uh, but he based the reversal of the conviction on the 14th Amendment's due process clause. Hugo Black and William O. Douglas agreed with the results but entered concurrences stating that the reversal should have been on specific proposal parts of the uh, Fourth and Fifth Amendments, positions they had held ever since they came on the court and which would ultimately be adopted by the Warren Court. More attention is paid to dissents than concurrences. While lawyers and judges may understand the distinctions made in a concurrence, the general public may not. After all, the result is still the same. A dissent, however, says to everyone, this case is wrong. It has reached the wrong result through faulty reasoning. Judge Jesse Carter of California called the dissenting opinion a forecast of things to come. These are the great dissents, the prophetic ones, whose arguments eventually win out. One should note that some of the prophetic dissents took years before the court adopted their views. Stephen Field's interpretation of the 14th Amendment's due process clause in the Slaughterhouse case took a quarter century before it became majority opinion. The first Justice Harlan's dissent in the civil rights cases and Plessy v. Ferguson were not validated until the 1950s and 1960s. The free speech arguments of Holmes and Brandeis in the 1920s did not see full acceptance until 1969. Hugo Black lived not only to see his argument for the necessity of a lawyer in a criminal case win over majority, but two decades after writing the dissent in Betts and Brady, he was given the assignment to write the new rule as well in Gideon versus Wainwright. Justice Scalia has suggested that the decisions most likely to be overruled are those 
decided by a five to four vote. One might think that in closely divided cases, the force of the dissent is nearly as great as that of the majority, and in some instances, this is true. But another reason is that ever since the 1930s, the court, most of the time, has been closely divided, and in these instances, the death or retirement of one or two justices can reverse the court's decision. Ever since the 1970s, there has been a conservative block of three or four justices and a liberal or moder moderate block of the same number. And then there are those who are right in the middle, Lewis F. Powell, Sandra Day O'Connor, and Anthony Kennedy, who serve as the swing votes in the middle. None of these people uh, were ever on the wrong side of a five to four decision. How the replacement of any one justice can affect this balance and suddenly convert a previous dissent into a majority can be seen in the Citizens United case. Uh, that is, um, you, you're familiar with that, I imagine, a conservative advocacy group made a movie attacking Hillary Clinton, uh, who was then running for the Democratic presidential nomination. Uh, they want to make it available as video on demand within a period of time, 30 days that had been forbidden um, by the McCain-Feingold law. Now the court had originally upheld this law and this provision um, in 2003, um, claiming that this provision did not violate any free speech right. The major events that transpired between the court's approval of BCRA in 2003 and the decision of Citizens United in 2010 were the death of Chief Justice Rehnquist and his replacement by John Roberts, and the retirement of Sandra Day O'Connor and her replacement by Samuel Alito. Court watchers generally see Roberts as jurisprudentially similar to the man he replaced and for whom he once clerked. But they view Alito as far more conservative than O'Connor, who for nearly two decades was the swing vote in five to four decisions and the fifth vote in upholding um, the McCain-Feingold law in 2003. Um, although it is often easiest to follow the dialogue within the court, the justices speak not only with each other, but with other participants in our constitutional government. And so let us take a quick look at these other members of the dialogue. Aside from constitutional interpretation, a major task of the court is statutory interpretation of the laws passed by Congress and signed by the president. Clearly, not every law requires a court hearing, and even those that may wind up in the district courts or the courts of appeal may not raise questions that require the Supreme Court to review it. When the court passes on legislation, two primary questions arise. The first is whether Congress had power under the Constitution to enact the statute in the first place. Uh, if Congress has exceeded the power, then the law is held unconstitutional. And the only way to override that type of decision is by the amendment process. More often, the complicated process of drafting a bill has resulted in language that is far from clear as to either meaning or application. Um, that's another problem. You know, next time you're telling people what's wrong with Congress, they can't write worth a darn. <laughs> Just add that to the list. Now, the courts are sometimes asked to determine what Congress meant. Now, sometimes Congress is deliberately dull. In the late part of the 19th century, uh, due to popular demand, they passed the Sherman Antitrust Act, which has a number of clauses that are hardly intelligible. When somebody in the Senate got up to ask, well, what does this mean? The answer was, we have the foggiest idea, let the courts figure it out. <laughs> now, some justices are willing to look at things like legislative history and statements made. Others, like Scalia, are not. Now, statutory interpretation that does not involve constitutionality can be remedied by Congress revising the statute to make it clearer or to say to the courts, this is not what we meant. Recently, the court ruled, well, recently within the last 15 years, uh, the court ruled that the Equal Pay Act required an employee who believed that she was being discriminated against because of gender to file a complaint within 180 days of the violation. The Equal Employment Opportunity Commission had interpreted this provision to mean 
within 180 days of learning about the discrimination. After all, how can you file a complaint if you don't know you're being discriminated against? Lily Ledbetter had worked for many years at Goodyear before learning about the discrepancy in pay that affected her and other women employees. The majority decision effectively barred nearly all women from suing since few, if any, would have known within six months that her pay was less than that of a man in a similar job. Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, dissenting for herself and three other justices, not only attacked the majority for its crabbed holding, but also called upon Congress to modify the law and make it clear that the 180-day clock ran from the time one learned about the uh, inequity. Before the day was over, Senator Hillary Rodham Clinton of New York announced she would submit such a bill, and it soon became obvious that a majority in both houses of Congress would support it. Business lobbies inundated the White House with protests, and George W. Bush declared that if Congress passed such a bill, he would veto it. When Barack Obama became president, he immediately invited Congress to pass what he termed the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Law and promised he would sign it. Congress acted with alacrity, and Obama signed the bill as one of his first acts as president on January 29th of 2009. The court interacts with the president as well. In some cases, it is a question of whether the law the president is executing is being done right or whether it's constitutional. But there are other times when the question of the president's authority comes up. One of the most famous cases involved Harry Truman in the steel seizure case of 1952. The threat of a strike by the United Steel Workers led Truman to conclude that a strike would jeopardize steel production in the midst of the Korean War. Truman believed he had the same power as Franklin Roosevelt had exercised in World War II and directed Secretary of Commerce Charles Sawyer to seize and operate most of the nation's steel mills. Truman had no statutory authority to do this and claimed he was acting under the author executive authority of the president. Congress, however, had enacted the Taft-Hartley Law that included procedures by which the governments could secure an 80-day cooling off period to postpone any strike that might adversely affect the public interest. Truman, however, had no desire to utilize this law since he had vetoed it and then watch Congress pass it over his veto. The Supreme Court voted six to three that Truman had exceeded his authority, that he had a congressionally sanctioned method that provided him a tool with which to handle the matter. More recently, one can see a dialogue between the court and President George W. Bush over a legal process due to detainees held at the Guantanamo Naval Base in Cuba. After the beginnings of the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, the army captured prisoners, some of whom the Bush administration labeled enemy combatants. It decided that these men would not be treated as prisoners of war, but held incommunicado and without redress to American courts. Cases attacking this policy began almost immediately with a majority of the lower courts, as well as the Supreme Court ruling that the administration had exceeded its authority under the war powers granted the president in Article II. Um, and you could follow this dialogue because um, Bush, thanks to his advisor, said you don't really have to listen to the Supreme Court. So we'll just, instead of doing it, they tell us we'll just do a little bit of it, at which the court came back and said, uh -uh, you have to do all of it. Um, in each and every one, the court told the president that he could not do what he was doing. In these cases, we can see the justices, both the majority and the dissenters, reaching out beyond the courtroom to talk to the president, to Congress, to the people. Both Justice Kennedy, speaking to the majority in the Boumediene case, as well as Justice Scalia in dissent, were trying to teach a civics lesson. Around this time, Justice Kennedy spoke to a group at the court in which he said that he considered education to be one of the most important tasks of a justice. Decisions and the reasons behind them had to made, be made clear not just to lawyers, but to the public as well. In a democracy, there are, or should be, many participants in a conversation on public policy. The court, the president, 
the Congress, all have voices that are clearly heard. But there are others for whom the constitutional dialogue is also important. One group consists of judges on state and lower federal courts. For them, the Supreme Court's constitutional rulings are supposed to provide guidance, and in most cases they do. When, however, there is a convincing dissent, these lower court judges may very well try to distinguish the facts of a case so that they can follow the dissent rather than the majority. The dialogue with the legal academy may not generate much public attention, but is of concern to jurists and to law professors, especially since many judges are former law professors. Louis Brandeis became the first justice to cite a law review article in the Supreme Court opinion. He encouraged law reviews to analyze and criticize court decisions because through such examination, mistakes could be made clear. Today, of course, citing law articles is a common practice, and in some cases, one has what might be seen as dueling sources between the majority and dissenting opinions. Chief Justice William Howard Taft, who taught at the Yale Law School prior to his appointment, accused Harlan Fisk Stone, the former dean of the Columbia Law School, of, quote, hungering for the applause of the law school professors, unquote. Supreme Court cases, of course, are at the heart of most law school courses. And in the Socratic method employed in most schools, students and teachers engage in a rigorous analysis of cases, both the majority and dissenting opinion. A dissenter may hope, even if she will never know, that her arguments won, won over um, a young law student who will later utilize that reasoning perhaps as a judge. Finally, Barry Friedman has convincingly argued that much of the Supreme Court's prestige and influence has resulted because they do pay attention to public sentiment. Long ago, Mr. Dooley said that the court follows the election returns. And there is no question that the justices, who are for the most part quite politically sophisticated, are aware of the limits of public tolerance. When the court has gone too far, as in Dred Scott or Roe v. Wade, uh, or in opposing New Deal measures, there has been a vigorous public reaction. One can see the court taking a firm stand in the case establishing an individual's right to die, but treading carefully in the assisted suicide cases, preferring to leave the matter to the political process. In 1986, when the court ruled that homosexuals had no right to engage in consensual sex, the gay community and civil liberties group praised the dissent of Justice Blackmun, but for the most part, the public did not find the decision unwelcome. Over the next quarter century, however, public acceptance of gays and lesbians increased markedly, especially among younger adults. So when a split court in 2000 upheld the Boy Scouts of America policy to exclude gays, the general reaction was far more critical, and this time the dissent found a fairly wide audience. In 2003, the court reversed itself and held that gays did have a right of privacy that the state could not impair. This time, the opinion stirred little controversy and the dissent was seen as reactionary. Finally, in 2013, with public opinion polls showing a majority of Americans supporting the right of gays to marry, the court struck down DOMA over the impassioned, one might say, rabid dissent of Justice Scalia. Uh, let me just add one word about, sometimes you never know what's going to happen. Okay, Justice Scalia's dissent in um, the gay marriage case, um, in which he really struck out, and you know, he, it was Scalia in full bloom. <laughs> but part of what he said was, do you know what this is going to do now? Although they tried to keep the majority opinion on a basis of federalism, the words equal protection snuck in here and there i.e. people who are homosexual are entitled to the equal protection of the laws. And Scalia said, see, they said equal protection. You know what's going to happen next? They're going to challenge every single marriage law in every single state, and they're going to do it by looking at this. And God knows the very next day, the American Civil Liberties Union in Virginia 
went into court and almost quoting Scalia word for word, uh, challenged the um, Virginia statute. At this point, I think something like 15 or 16 state statutes have been challenged in the federal court, and in every single one of them, the pattern has been the same. Well, Justice Scalia said, and it's, uh, so um, I'm not sure he would appreciate the thanks of the gay community on that. <laughs> now, I am not implying that the court was the most important voice in all the debates I have briefly mentioned. Policy making in a democracy involves multiple voices. And it is the dialogue between and among the participants that is critical. Dissent has been an important element within the court from its beginnings to the late, in the late 18th century. At the same time, the important dissents have involved the court with other political actors such as Congress, the president, and the public. Not all dissents have great impact, and the vast majority of them are soon and rightly forgotten. The majority decided correctly, public opinion supported the result, Congress or the president accepted the results, and the cases themselves proved not to have lasting importance. But some dissents mattered greatly. They shaped the constitutional dialogue and successfully appealed, as Charles Evans Hughes said, to the intelligence of a future day. Thank you. Questions? Uh, apparently, my contract calls for me to answer questions. <laughs> yes? Can you comment on the court's decision on political finances? Um, not in the time I have. <laughs> um, I have a real problem with that, in part because I happen to agree with the First Amendment argument. Money is speech. Let me give you an example. Let us assume I am not the golden tongue boy you have just heard. <laughs> All right? um, but I do have strong political views. I just can't articulate them. I'm shy. I don't want to run for public office. But my friend Tim over there is not shy. He wants to run for public office, and he and I agree on everything. The difference is I have a godzillion dollars, and so I want to give Tim as much money as I can for his campaign because... Who's speaking when I give him money? Both of us. Both of us. That's my way of speaking. So I do have a, I believe I do have a First Amendment right to give money to candidates. And if I have a lot of money, I should be able to give a lot of money. The problem, and this is something that neither the Congress nor the court really dealt with, is how to get transparency. Tim's constituents ought to know that he's being funded, or in part at least, by me. Okay. Uh, we ought to know whom the Koch brothers are giving money to, to put it simply. And that, uh, I don't think uh, McCain-Feingold or the court has really dealt with. Um, so I don't like the results because uh, in some ways the way they went around it, overturning precedents as if they had no value. Um, but on the First Amendment, they may have been right. Yes? Would you be able to comment on the... Um uh, transparency bills for insider trading? I think they should be there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Look, um, you know, the old thing, in, you know, you've all seen enough CSI episodes. Um, who benefits, right? That's the first question they ask when they're looking for a suspect, who benefits, all right? Well, an inside trader, we know who benefits. The question there is who suffers? And the answer is everybody else. Um, it's a crapshoot. Would you go into, I understand there's a casino, where is it here? Just a couple miles down the road? If you knew that the tables were rigged. Are they? <laughs> you wouldn't go into a casino if you knew that the tables were rigged against you, right? Well, the stock market is a crapshoot. That's all it is. It's a big casino. And so at the very least, you know, I know all the economist <coughs> arguments about how you raise money for private enterprise, da 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 da, -da, -da. Um, but it's still a crapshoot. And it seems to me that not only should people who go into that casino um, 
have all the information that they can, but that the tables ought not to be rigged. And that's what I think the insider trading laws are about. Okay? Yes? Um, do you think Ginsburg's dissent on the Hobby Lobby case is going to be one of those that makes a substantial contribution to the Constitution Dialogue or one of those that... Uh, no, I'll tell you why. Because for all the uproar, Hobby Lobby is a very, very narrow case. It only affects two or three methods of birth control. Most of them are still in place. And it only affects closely held corporations. All right? Most closely held corporations are so small that they're not required under the ACA to even provide insurance. Okay. Once you get a big corporation, um, Hobby Lobby is the exception rather than the rule. So for all that I think the court was wrong, and that she was right, I don't think that case is going to have as much of an impact as some people uh, seem to think. Yes? Um, some recent opinions, particularly of Sotomayor's attachment defense of affirmative action or Ginsburg's defense of women's rights have been characterized as increasingly personal. Um, would you say that this is a trend that the court is going towards more personal defense, and do you think it may have some type of impact? It's been going on for a while. Um, among my friends in the Washington Press Corps who cover the court, there was a, uh, uh, a dissent known as Sandra, you slut you, in which uh, Scalia you know, attacked one of um, you know, O'Connor's opinions. Uh, I got called right after, you know, by a reporter right after the Sotomayor thing. Um, Roberts is extremely sensitive, more so than Rehnquist was, and he doesn't like that to happen. But in the end, there are nine people here. And the magic number, as Justice Brennan always said, is five. So if you're going to really, you know, you've got to be very careful uh, that when you really get up there and want to lay into the majority, you don't do it too often, because you may need those people tomorrow for one of your opinions. Um, I doubt if too many people will even remember it, um, you know, that part, uh, within a year. Okay? Yes? Going back to the Hobby Lobby case, do you think that the reasoning using RIFRA uh, could not have been uh, expanded upon? Perhaps there's a more fundamental uh, freedom within, expanded within the Constitution that they could have used rather than RIFRA? Well, you know, part of their problem is they would like to make corporations persons, in, uh, the majority would, in every instance. And they had just been under an enormous amount of flack for holding that corporations are persons for First Amendment rights. All right? Um, to hold that corporations are now persons for religious liberty rights, um, even Scalia would think that might be pushing the envelope a bit much. Now, um, there may be sufficient rationale. I have a friend out in California who's working, uh, you know, coming up with some interesting things. It turns out that many of us thought that courts first started treating corporations as persons in the 1890s. It turns out that uh, that goes back much further than that. And that courts have always held uh, corporations to be persons, at least under some parts of the law. You know, it's not something new. This court is taking it further than a lot of earlier courts. But I think even they would have a hard time, once you moved away from the closely held corporation, to, um, you know, how many millions of shareholders are there who hold Apple stock? You know, it'd be hard, hard to say that Apple... Some people say they don't even have a soul, much less religion, you know, so it's... <laughs> One more, yes, sir. I believe it was Justice uh, Sotomayor, during her hearings, alluded to her willingness to look at laws in other countries... Yes. ...upon which to make decisions relative to our Constitution. What are your thoughts on that? Well, you know, that's been the case in the U.S. Supreme Court ever since the beginning. There are a couple of things, one of which is when it comes to international law, you do want to know what other countries are interpreting because international law, for all that it's adherents say, it's, you know, it's 
easy to understand, is not. International law is what the strongest countries say it is. Okay? But where we have gotten into a lot of trouble is when we've looked at things like the execution of minors, death penalty. Um, Scalia is very much against it. Uh, Kennedy, on the other hand, and Ginsburg have both been willing to look at what is the practice in other countries. Um, I think you can only do that, though, in those areas where you cannot get sufficient guidance from the Constitution itself. Now, look, I have very little use for Scalia's originalist interpretation. Um, I can tell you a, a story to explain why. Uh, as those of you who took your American history course last year, whenever, uh, remember we had a revolution back here in the 1770s. And in 1777, uh, we won a major battle in Saratoga. Battle of Saratoga, right? Beat gentleman Johnny Burgoyne. That battle convinced the French to help us. And in 1778, we signed a treaty of alliance with France where they give us money, troops, and a navy. But part of this says that if France is ever in a war with a foreign power, we will protect French possessions in the Caribbean. Okay. Fast forward 15 years to 1793, and lo and behold, France is involved in a major battle with, you know, war with Great Britain. That will not be over until 1815. The king has lost his head, and the new government says, United States, we call upon you to live up to your treaty obligations from this treaty. Okay. There's one little, little problem. We don't have a navy. <laughs> And it's sort of hard to go down into the Caribbean and protect French possessions there if you don't have any ships to send. So everybody says we have to be neutral. Uh, all sorts of reasons are given. The treaty was with the Bourbons. The Bourbons are no longer among us, therefore we don't have to do it. Um, they want to be neutral if for no other reason than they know we can't do anything about it. But Washington wants to know what constitutional power does he have to issue a proclamation of neutrality? As he usually does, he turns to his cabinet and he asks Hamilton and Jefferson to advise him. Hamilton tells him it's part of your executive powers to deal with foreign countries. Go ahead and issue it. You have the authority. Jefferson says, no, 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 only Congress can declare war, therefore only Congress can declare neutrality, and you have to go to Congress and ask them for a declaration of neutrality. Washington, as he usually did, listens to Hamilton, who, and issues a declaration of neutrality, at which point Jefferson calls on Madison and says, take up your pen, dear sir, and strike this heresy in its bosom immediately. Madison had a few other things going on at that kind, but you know, he could never say no to Jefferson. So he picks out some Greek or Latin name, you know, writes some essays under it, which says president can't do this. Hamilton, who could write as fast as Madison did, then issues, also under a Greek or Roman name, a series of essays saying the president can. Now, the whole point of this story Washington was president of the Constitutional Convention. Alexander Hamilton was a delegate from New York to the Constitutional Convention. James Madison wrote the Constitution practically. Hamilton and Madison wrote the Federalist Papers. And while Jefferson wasn't in Philadelphia, he was part of that generation. Now, how can Antonin Scalia say that everything we have to know, we can go back and look at the founding documents when these men who were at the Constitutional Convention and wrote the darn thing can't even agree five years later what it means. Um, so I think now, I didn't forget your question, which is about foreign decisions. The Eighth Amendment says there cannot be cruel nor unusual punishment. Now, unlike some other provisions of the Constitution, there is absolutely nothing in the founding documents 
to tell us what this means. It wasn't part of the original Constitution. It's the Eighth Amendment, right? And there's nothing in the um, debates in Congress about it other than that it showed up on a list that several of the states submitted that they wanted amendments made of. What is cruel and unusual punishment? Other than making you sit through a long lecture in a hot auditorium <laughs> when you could be outside tossing frisbees. Um, the answer is we don't know. Now Scalia says it means what it meant then. So if you could execute a, a child, then you can execute a child now. If you could execute somebody who is mentally defective, then you can execute that person now. Um, Brennan, on the other hand, believed in a living constitution, that the provisions of the constitution, while you started with what the original intent was, you then have to look at what the story is now. Somebody once asked William O. Douglas what he thought the founding fathers might have thought about wiretapping. He looked at the question and he said, are you crazy? They didn't even have telephones. How could they think about wiretapping? So Brennan and Douglas both believe what, you know, if a question comes up, you have to go back and look at the words of the Constitution, that's where you always start, but what would it mean now? What does civilized behavior mean now? Now clearly I think the case that, you know, we most likely understand here is that of gay rights. There were none in colonial times. In fact, in some places homosexual activity was punishable by death. Uh, we have as, you know, come a long ways from that. Uh, are we to interpret how we treat gays and lesbians uh, the same way they were in 1787? Or are we supposed to treat them how a majority of the people think about them today? And I think one way you do this is what do other countries do? We're not the only country in the world. These questions have not come up just in our Supreme Court. They've come up in other places. And while I would not say that we have to be slavish in following what foreign courts say, I have absolutely no problem with judges looking there to see what these courts have said and why they've said it. Again, thank you very much.